All right. Hello, everyone. It's Jeff Coleman again, as you know, with Cavi Church. I'll pull up our slideshow for the day. Oh, hold on. Got to share my screen. There we go. So we, um, we've finished up Angels, Satan, and Demons last week, and now we are on Darwinian evolution uh, this week, and then we'll talk about creation next week. So we're on the doctrine of man now. Uh, so we'll be talking about man's fall, um, what is a human being, which is a major question in our culture today, things like that. But we'll start with the origin. And this week we'll discuss Darwinian evolution. And then next week we'll talk about the origin of man as uh, taught in the Bible. So Darwinian evolution, is it a plausible theory? So evolution this week, the Bible and origins next week, then July 31st, the creation of man. And then August 7th, the facets of man, August 14th, the fall of man, and we'll take a break on August 21st. Let's pray, and then we'll um, get into the content for today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, what your Bible reveals about reality. We thank you that we can orient our thinking to your thinking through the Word of God and through the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. We thank you that uh, you gave us re minds that can reason and use logic and um, consider evidence and consider various arguments. And we pray that you'll help us to have logical, sharp minds this morning as we talk about the um, theory of Darwinian evolution. I pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So obviously, the topic of evolution is very, very important. Um, no subject is more widely debated than how man originated. And obviously, it impacts everything. If you get the man's origin wrong, then you pretty much get everything wrong. So this is like the major battle. Where did we come from? Where did we come from? Court cases have given global publicity to this subject. Have you heard of the Scopes Monkey Trial? The Scopes Monkey Trial, that was back in the 1920s in the States. It was basically uh, the school board uh, or the state of Tennessee passed a law saying that um, you could teach, you had to teach creation and not evolution, okay? That's in Tennessee. It's a conservative state. Was too back in the 1920s. So the pro uh, evolu the evolutionary uh, uh, um, lobby or the pro evolutionists uh, wanted to um, get that law declared uh, void, null and void, because it violated. I don't know if it violated the state constitution. It doesn't, it wouldn't violate the U.S. constitution, but basically probably the state constitution. Welcome, Michael. And um, basically it was, uh, the, it was highly publicized and uh, the evolutionists were able to get that law overturned and evolution was allowed to be in the schools. But times have changed. Now it would be just flip-flop. Uh, you know, you'd have to file a lawsuit to get creationism to, to be able to be taught in the school in Tennessee. But obviously court cases, I was just talking about the Scopes monkey trial, which you would be familiar with, right, Michael? Yeah. So the debate. Was the evidence? <laughs> <laughs> so the debate, uh, it's also important in the church because it also impacts our view of the Bible because Genesis 1 and 2 talk about the origin of man. And there's a debate over whether the Bible is inerrant, in other words, without error or not. Um, so the, whether the Bible is inerrant seems to depend a lot on whether it tells the truth about what actually happened 
at the creation of the world and the creation of human beings, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Was that historical? If it wasn't historical, then why should we be, believe anything the Bible says? Okay, so it's, it's super important. And there are a number of views about the origin of the universe and the origin of man among Christians. Uh, we must say that. There are three separate but related questions when it comes to origin. And you could have a, you and I could have a different answer to these three questions. Um, I'd say number three is by far the most important. I'm willing to live with other views on one and two but I'm not willing to budge on three, the, the special creation of Adam and Eve, okay? That's where I personally draw the line. Now, when is the universe 6,000 years old or is it 247 billion? I don't know, yeah, whatever it is. You know, I, I have what I think is correct, but I'm willing to be wrong. And that that and, and I believe I can still correctly interpret Genesis one and two, no matter how old the universe is. Same thing with planet Earth. I mean, Genesis one, two says that the Earth was formless and void. Well, how long was that for and why was it formless and void? And there's we've talked about various theories about that. Um, one second, Michael. And then but but the third question is how and when did human beings originate? I think you have to have a young, it's not young earth, because that's number two, but I think the human race is relatively young. However old the earth and the universe are, the human race is relatively young. And we have exact numbers, you know, in the genealogies with respect to, to Adam, to Noah, and so forth. So just realize there's three separate questions, and the third here is what we're focused on and what's the most important. Michael, you had something? Um, uh, if you, one of the big problems is you have to discount the book of Hebrews then, because the book of Hebrews declares that the earth, we know by faith that the earth is created in six days. Hebrews doesn't say that. Um, it's not Hebrews. Exodus, Exodus mentions in the, in six Hebrews days. 11. I, I'm sorry, I don't have my glasses, so I. But the other thing that you notice is um, Jesus teaches constantly out of Genesis one. Yeah, they have quite all. And you, mm. honestly, you, if you if you let one go, they all go, and Jesus's teaching goes, and Hebrews goes, and the book goes. I, I mean, right? He, Jesus teaches out of Genesis one all the time, and the one, two, and the three. Um, and so it's it's really it's it's interesting because I, I'm a physicist, <laughs> and um. I struggled with this for a long time, and the only way that I've ever found a biblical worldview to come is not by addressing the issues, it's by being in the scriptures, and mm. you finally get to the point where your brain switches, um, so anyhow, I, I won't go into all that, but um, <laughs> thanks, Michael. Anyhow, I, I just, I think sometimes we, we think anyhow. So well, we, that. so don't forget next week, and you weren't here at the beginning, but Next week, we're going to talk about what the Bible says and the different views people have with keeping scripture as your authority. Today, we're poking holes in Darwinian evolution. So let's get started with that. So there are three major views about the origin of life and the origin of man. So we're really focused on the origin of life. Actually, here, you know, we could have a fourth question. How did life originate? And then how did human beings originate? So there's actually four origin questions. The universe, earth, 
life and man. Okay. And we, and we, there's four different, four different really answers. Um, so Darwinian evolution is the first major view. Seven, several billion years ago, chemicals in the sea acted on by sunlight and cosmic energy formed by chance into one or more single celled organisms. <laughs> These organisms have since developed through beneficial mutations and natural selection into all living plants, animals, and people that we see. So no intelligence involved, simply by chance. <laughs> so, and we should say here, no one denies that change and development occur in many areas of creation, right? No one's denying that human beings who eat more meat get bigger. Thus, we have huge rugby players in New Zealand. We won't talk too much about rugby today. <laughs> um, so no one denies, but they're still humans, aren't they? They're just big humans. A taller giraffe is just a taller giraffe. It's not a new species. So no one is denying microevolution. The question is, does macroevolution happen through natural processes? So God is totally unnecessary to this view, Darwinian evolution, uh, to, to, the, to the development of biological life forms we see today. And this thing always gets in the way. Let me just try it. I'll put it up here and see if that's better. And man, um, e man evolved over long periods of time from simpler brute forms, that is primates, and ultimately, if we go back far enough, from an original single-celled creature. So that's the view of Darwinian evolution. Charles Darwin said, I will give absolutely nothing for the theory of natural selection if it requires miraculous additions at any one stage of descent. Okay? So he's not willing to consider the intervention of God at any stage zero zilch. And this would be the view of, you know, most Darwinists today. There's absolutely no place for a God, God of the gaps or, you know, an intervention, a supernatural intervention. Julian Huxley is called Darwin's bulldog. Uh, and he wrote in Evolution in Action to postulate a divine interference with these exchanges of matter and energy at a particular moment in the Earth's history is both unnecessary and illogical. I believe that both of those people have changed their minds. <laughs> stardust yeah that's neil degrasse tyson says that all right the second <coughs> sorry <coughs> the second view is like tries to have both like it tries to compromise and bring them together it's called theistic evolution and it says that God invisibly directed, used, and controlled the processes of natural evolution to create the world and all life in it. So it says that the earth and pre-human life is very or are very old, and it views the days of Genesis as ages and not 24-hour days you know, long periods of time. And evolutionary processes were involved in the creation of Adam. Okay, that's very important. So it tries to reconcile science and Christianity together. Now, there's two versions of this. One says that God intervened at the start only. This would be the view of many Roman Catholics, theologians, actually, and many neo-Orthodox 
theologians. So basically, they concede that it couldn't have started without God, but once God started it, maybe he made the first single-celled or organism, and then he stood back and watched it do its magical wonder and create human beings. There's yeah. A film about that called Prometheus. Prometheus. Yeah, where they see the, the aliens from outer space. Oh, oh aliens, space. right. Yeah. So, okay. So, but another view, which is which is obviously going to be closer to what Christians believe, but not what Christians believe, is that God, he stepped in at the beginning. But then at various times, he would step in again. Maybe he would, he would, okay, the, for a while, there's just single-celled organisms, and then bam, now there's multi, and then bam, a, a few thousand years later, he, now we've got uh, like little tadpoles, and, and then bam, oh, now we have land reptiles, and bam, now we have birds. You know, so, but he used the process of evolution generally, and he just came in and, you know, really got it jumpstart like a, you know, like a, yeah. So that's two different views of theistic evolution. And then finally, there's the view of creation. And this says that science contributes to our understanding, but it must not control our interpretation of scripture to accommodate its theories which after all could be <laughs> wrong, right? That what science says today, um, often scientists will think, you know, how could we be wrong? But, yeah, that, that but history like shows there's a great book called uh, The Scientific, it's by Thomas Kuhn, yep, yep, yep. The Revolu uh, Scientific Revolutions. Yep. He's a philosopher of science and he just shows, you know, you scientists, I mean, we're, they're human. They get trapped into group think and it's hard for them to think outside the box, even when the data contradicts the box. And he, he goes a little bit further to say that any yeah. major scientific discovery came by revelation. <laughs> Einstein, DNA, yeah. DNA. DNA was a complete revelation. The guy had been working on the idea for years mm. and years and years trying to figure it out. And he said he woke up in the middle of the night with a twisted ladder. And <laughs> that's like, cool. Why, what, and what, why am yeah. I dreaming of twisted ladders? Newton. And he later was doing a study and then he went, oh, twisted ladder. ladder. And it was a revelation. <laughs> but, but he goes on. Yeah, true. To discuss many that's many good. Things like that. That were just instantaneous revelation. Yeah, classic, classic book right there. That probably, if if you want to get into some good reading, read that book. Think of Einstein. You know, the day he thought of the general and special theories of relativity, or Newton. You know, when he discovered his laws. Uh, uh, yeah, Newton just was, Newton was a Bible scholar first. Well, yeah, he he wrote books, commentaries on Revelation and stuff, but um. So uh, God directly, so this says that God directly created man in his image from the dust of the ground and his own breath of life, okay? So that, and there's no subhuman primate or anything else involved, straight from the dust and the breath of life. And Adam means ground, dust, so however the days of Genesis 1 are interpreted, Adam was the first man and the account of his creation in Genesis 2 is historical. Adam is the first man from whom Eve was formed and the rest of mankind is descended. So this is the creation view. So let's, the rest of the time we're going to be focused on Darwinian evolution. So in Darwinian, Darwinian evolution, it typically goes with the Big Bang view that the planets and stars resulted from a Big Bang explosion of compressed, rotating protons and neutrons. Okay, we're not going to, that's going back to the origin of the universe. Um, we can ask, where did the protons and neutrons come from? Why is there something rather than nothing? But this is not what we're talking about today, but that's the cosmological argument for the existence of God, which I talked about 
I think last Jan or two Januarys ago. Um, that we have a sermon on that back on our um, on our website. But life began completely by chance when a single cell appeared from non-living matter. Okay? And all other living organisms have developed from that first life form, having gradually increased in complexity. So you're a physicist. Physicist or phys yeah, am I saying that right? I, you studied physics. Yeah, you're a physicist. So you like equations, right? So basically, we can sum up evolution with this equation. Mutations, M, plus natural selection, NS, times time, T, equals evolution, E. All right? So it's very, keep, it, keep that in mind. We're going to really focus on this. We're going to go through each one. So mutations plus natural selection over a long period of time equals evolution. Let's look at it doesn't work, you just add time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, lots and lots of time. <laughs> um, so let's look at mutations. So we're focused on the M here. Um, mutations are sudden small changes in the DNA code of genes passed on to offspring causing them to differ from their parents, okay? They could be good or bad. Um, if enough mutations occur and are preserved, remember, you it's not enough to just have a mutation. You have to preserve it in your genes and pass it on to your offspring. That's the really more amazing than the mutation itself. Um, then the organism will become more complex and evolve into a different organism, okay? Well, does that require so... Increase. Yeah, increase. the importance of mutations for evolution cannot be overemphasized. Going back to Sir Julian Huxley, not only is it in an effective agency of evolution, talking about mutations, but it is the only effective agency of evolution. So every, it is, it's all or nothing on whether mutations can create new species. Let's look at, so now we're looking at the NS, natural selection. Natural selection is the mechanism that preserves changes caused by mutations. When a change occurs that is beneficial to the organism, natural selection comes in and preserves that change because it is beneficial. Okay, so you should should have some red flags going off. Harmful changes are not preserved because they are bred out of the line as useless. So it's a pretty magical process. Beneficial mutation increases the complexity of the organism. I would say if there was a nuclear war, I don't think humans would be the most adapted to survive. I think it'd be like, yeah, scorpions, cockroaches. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If the goal is to survive, I wouldn't want to be human. <laughs> the selection process is raw nature, very important. No intelligence is allowed. So it's not like a hothouse, right? It's not like a laboratory where you can, or developing roses or a better variety of tomatoes there's no intelligence allowed okay and then we have time long periods of time are necessary to evolution since mutations do not occur frequently okay mutations do not occur frequently so there has to be a lot of time for the beneficial mutations to occur and be preserved by natural selection. So in order to decrease the time necessary, some evolutionaries, evolutionists propose bursts of mutations occurring at about the same time, which shortens the time required for the ne necessary changes to take place. Bursts. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The eye has to pop into place in one generation. <laughs> you can see this, yeah. We haven't even talked about the, the holes in this. We've just describing what evolution is. 
Yeah. All right. So you got it. So to, to review, mutations plus natural selection times time equals evolution. Now, let's talk about some problems with each of these. First, let's go to mutations. First, mutations are rare and almost always harmful to the organism. For example, in the famous fruit fly experiment, um, they, they, I forget how they were forcing the mutations, but they, they used a process by which they were speeding up mutations. I don't know if it's electricity or some kind of, they, I forget how, but basically they were artificially cause it, trying to cause mutations to happen so that they could watch evolution take place. Um, and even with their artificial means of causing mutations, only one fruit fly out of a million developed any mutation. And the problem was most, almost all of those mutations were harmful. Like instead of two eyes, three eyes, you know, instead of six legs, eight legs. And there was obviously no new organ or no new system that arose from these experiments. So no mutation has ever produced a new species, a new organ, a new cis or a new system existing species. And you're talking about very complicated systems, even in a fruit fly, the digestive system of a fruit fly, the reproductive you know, laying eggs, that's complicated. It doesn't matter that a fruit fly is this big. It's actually more impressive that it's that big and yet it's able to reproduce. So mutations produce changes in existing organisms. We all agree to that. That's why we don't, you know, that's why we have uh, different features when we're born. But they do not produce new uh, organisms. There's zero evidence that Even mutations. Evidence yeah. In one situation, yeah. Where genetic information was increased. It always decreases. Well, that's the law of entropy, which we're getting to. Yeah. But you're right. It decreases. It's harmful, and it doesn't add information. It had to start with information already there, right? Now let's go to natural selection. What are the problems with natural selection? First, intelligent laboratory selection, like developing a better rose that's drought tolerant, for example, that does produce improvements. We can do that, but who's, who's acting in that case? An intelligent mind, a human being, is causing that rose to be more drought tolerant through different processes, but there is little evidence natural selection can do the same. In fact, you know, there's really no evidence. It's blind. It has no intelligence whatsoever. Natural, further, natural selection would not recognize the worth of a single mutation while waiting for the other mutations to happen that would be necessary for the production of a new organ or system in the organism. Uh, this is the problem of irreducible complexity. So in other words, let's say that we have a full human being minus the eye, okay? And all we need to, to become what we know today as a human is the development of an eye. Now, the eye is... If it was simple, if it had one or two things that it needed to function, you maybe, maybe it could happen by chance. It would be a, one chance in a million, more than a million. Be, but there might be a small chance. But the eye, I mean, we still about sixty-four components that are used. Uh, what's, what's the word? Components. Yeah. The components that are something. Irreducible. What, what is the word you use? Uh, yeah, irreducible components if you, or. If you take any one of the 64 components out. Lowest common denominator. System, the yeah. Whole, the whole system stops working. 
Right. And that's that's actually one of the things that hit me in science. Absolutely. Walking with the Lord. So was, yeah, yeah. So if so, in other words, if I'm if my son is born with one twentieth of an eye, you might think, oh, that's great. We just need more time and we'll get a full eye eventually. But the problem is one twentieth of an eye doesn't help my son. It hurts my son and has absolutely no benefit to him whatsoever. So it all has to come at once or not at all. It's too complex. And that that's just I think of all the systems in our body. So that's the problem with natural selection. Yeah, so that's right. That's the good. Yeah, the male and female have to evolve at the same time. So maybe they need that burst of magical energy or something. Someone saying what's that the amount of fossils that you would need we're all standing on top of piles and piles and piles and piles of fossils. For these for this to even be a possibility. Yeah, and they're not there. Yeah, that's right. So time, there's problems with time as well. The odds, and this is one, we're talking about one usable protein. The odds are uh, 10 to the 161st to one that one usable protein would have been produced by chance in all of history as we know it. So that, and 10 to 161, you know what that means, right? That's 10 with 161 zeros behind it. So one chance in that many zeros, 161, it would take you a while to write it out, that one usable protein would have been produced by chance in all of history. Others say one to the one out of 10 to the 243rd or one out of 10 to the 160th. These are these are top scientists, you know, this is this and different scientists from different universities that have come up with these numbers. So that's one protein. Is one protein enough to create a living being that reproduces? Of course not. If one molecule were obtained, it would not help in arranging a second molecule. Even if you had a living molecule for five minutes that was able to live for five minutes, how would it know to reproduce? And where would the mechanism come for it to reproduce? <laughs> it's, so it needs an accurate duplication process, not just the fact of existence. So even if there was a duplication process, there are many kinds of proteins needed before there can be a living organism. One scientist, uh, biologist Morowitz, had a minimal cell. And he said that there has to be 239, a, a minimum for life, there has to be 239 protein molecules from 124 different species. So you need 239 proteins one uh, of and 124 types of proteins to get a minimal cell, just a cell. That's it. Not even, and it and there's no guarantee it will reproduce. So no matter how much time you have, the odds remain the same. The more time you have, it doesn't increase your odds. That's, that's a fallacy in, in reason. So no matter how many billions of years you have, it will not reduce the possibility of putting it in the range. Uh, I, I didn't put that right, but no matter how much time you, you have, the odds remain the same every second of however long you want to go for. So there's some severe problems. Now, this is my, I bring this one up a lot in campus evangelism. I love this one. So the second law of thermodynamics, of course, 
energy, right, cannot be created or destroyed, okay? So people are like, oh, energy can't be created or destroyed. Fine, yes. But the second law of thermodynamics says that although the energy in the cosmos remains constant, that is true, energy cannot be created or destroyed, there is what's called usable energy and used energy. And what's happening is that the usable energy is being depleted over time into uh, useless energy, okay? This is uh, uh, the basically entropy. So over time, the amount of usable energy lessens. And if we went to a, a couple billion years from now, we'd have zero usable energy the whole universe would be cold and still. There'd be no stars, no anything. It's like boiling. If you bo go home and boil water, you need fire. You need an element, right? And it's nice and hot. What will happen to that boiling water if you leave it for 30 minutes? It will come back to what temperature? Will it freeze? No, it'll go back to room temperature because room temperature is the flat line. And so the universe is doing the same thing. So everything is going towards less order and more chaos. Everything is uh, depleting, energy is depleting. So that tells us if we go back far enough in time, it had to start with the maximum energy into where we're not, because today we have less energy, less usable energy than we did at the beginning. The problem with evolution is it's going in the opposite direction. It's saying species are getting more complex over time, but that violates the fundamental law, the second law of thermodynamics. And one evolutionist said Darwinian evolution is, is the grand exception to the second law. So even they admit that, you know, that it does violate the second law of thermodynamics. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So it takes an intelligent orderer to bring order to the chaos. Do you know why human beings, what our job is? To bring order out of chaos, Genesis 2. That's our purpose. Yeah, yeah. But that's the redeemed humanity will bring order. Jesus is human. He brings order to the chaos. And in the new, in the millennium, we will see a lots of, lot more order because we'll have our king uh, ruling. So there's also problems with the fossil record. Um, so dating methods, first of all, dating methods are predicated on a uniform rate of decay of the particular element like carbon-14. We can't assume the rate of change has been uniform during the Earth's history. So when someone tells you, I know that the Earth is such and such billion years old, they have as an assumption that the rate of change of decay has been uniform all this time. But we can't go back in time and, and confirm that. And so it's a, it's a huge assumption when you're using those dating methods uh, in determining how old something is. Yeah, that's what I thought last week. I think it was last week when they, on the news, they found this or scientists have found this new um, <coughs> prehistoric dinosaur, and they kept saying it, it was found, and it, the, the guy made a statement like, you know, millions and millions of years ago, like, I can't remember. So I thought, yeah, he's just, a, he's just saying, I would say, it's assumed, because, I mean, I don't know, I wasn't there. Yeah. And I don't believe in his, you know, theory. But he just said, you know, it's a statement of fact. Right. So thought, you know, yeah, that's right. Now, transitional forms, the problem with, uh, the fossil record in evolution is that transitional forms have never been found among the millions of fossils that exist. 
And we, you know, we have tons more fossils today than in the day of Darwin. Darwin um, suspected that if we, if we discovered more and more fossils, the gaps would be filled, but they haven't. They simply haven't been fulfilled at all. Um, every once in a while, you'll read in the news about uh, some Neanderthal man that is a, a supposed link between primates and Homo sapiens, but you know, one was a pig, uh, pig bone or something. Yeah, no, the fraction of the tooth goes from the pig carn man. Yeah, the yeah, pig carn man. The so it's just a it's just a bone, yeah. and they 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 construct this big theory around one or two bones. Yeah, but that tooth, they, yeah. they've not only reconstructed a man, they also constructed his family and put it in a museum. So yeah, like yeah. <laughs> right. They'll put it in the Smithsonian. And kids go there, kids go to the Smithsonian, right? And they see this, you know, this, this, you've seen the evolutionary picture. And they're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And then, you know, that's how, that's how the whole society gets on the evolutionary track. So Peter, Peter Lining, uh, or Lyne, Peter Lyne, um, Peter Lyne is a professor in Australia. He's a regular contributor to Creation Magazine. And he was in Washington, D.C. and we went through the Museum of Natural History. And he, we were standing at the big wall of skulls. <laughs> and um, so he starts talking to me and he's deliberately talking to me, but he's talking loud so other people would listen. <laughs> he said, now um, you see that there's two tones to the skull. There's that which was actually there and you know what they did find and then what they didn't find and so which color <laughs> did you presume and i said well probably the stuff that's gray and looks like a dried bone is the actual and then the brown is not and he said no they reversed it <laughs> because the evidence was so damning they had to reverse it for instance oh wow and, and he took me back farther and farther and he said see this <laughs> see that chip that's all they had like a chip right here <laughs> and they constructed the rest yeah. of the skull from the chip so it was very <laughs> um we we need to close here in a second but the earliest fossils of each group so the earliest fossils um i'm thinking of those you've seen them uh the things that they swim in the ocean and swamps and stuff, but yeah. um, triobites, triobites, yeah, isopods, not sure, yeah. But the earliest fossils of each group, the thing is, they exhibit all the features of that group without any suggestion of graduation from one form to another. So they're the same thing as what you know we have later. So simple forms of life too are found in strata of rocks above more complex forms as well. And there's all sorts of things, Creation Magazine, yeah. there's all sorts of evidence that we don't have time to go to. So each one of the essential elements of evolution can be attacked, uh, can be questioned, can be destroyed basically by the evidence mutations, natural selection, time. Sorry, I, I need to have a, a red circle with a line, right? We don't have time, but this is a quite an interesting uh, free video that you might want to look up on YouTube. Ben Stein's expelled no intelligence allowed. It's, <laughs> I was going to play the trailer, but I don't have time. Um, a, uh, Darwinian, why do people guard evolution so strongly? It's because it's the foundation of their entire view of the world. And if it's shaken to the ground, if it's, if, if the ground is knocked from under their feet, their whole view of the world has to be changed. And they know that they know that scientism, secular humanism, uh, uh, um, existentialism, postmodernism, Marxism, they're all built on atheism, and atheism has as its core teaching Darwinian evolution. So that's why it's, 
That's why they will not allow a single voice of dissent in the academy at, at the university. It's, it's a religious war, basically. It's a war of religions. It is a religion. Atheism is a religion. Darwin and Darwinian evolution is its, it's part of its creed. It's part of its creed. Is natural, uh, natural, naturalism. Yep, that's it. It also sheds a lot of insight into why they have such strong views on abortion. Patients, they're not babies. Mm, yeah, ethics. It plays into ethics, law, everything. So that's why when you point out the weaknesses of Darwinian evolution, you are doing them a favor, you're doing society a favor, and it results in a society that's more in tune with God and more in tune with the love of God. Because there's no love in Darwinian evolution. None. And of course, Hitler was a social Darwinist. So expose the weaknesses. No one, no one expose the weaknesses. Uh, the rarity, point out the rarity and harmfulness of mutations. Point out that natural, selec natural selection's inability to preserve beneficial mutations. Point out the lack of time necessary for everything to happen by chance, given the impossibility point out the opposition to the second law of thermodynamics and the embarrassing gaps in the fossil record. It takes faith to believe in Genesis. It takes more faith to believe in Darwinian evolution. I don't have enough faith for that. Yeah, I don't have enough faith to be an evolutionist. No, but also Stalin and Mao Zedong, they also had the input by Darwin. Yep. Yep, communism, definitely. So next week, we'll get into creationism. In the beginning, God created the heavens yes. and the earth. Father, thank you for today. And uh, may we apply these things in our conversations with others. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.